Good evening, Ripley Tabernacle Baptist Church. Hope you all are having a wonderful Memorial Day uh, weekend so far. I hope that you enjoyed our services back in the building this morning. Um, I know it was a little weird and a little odd, of course, having two services going on at the same time. Um, but we, of course, just want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable. I understand that some just want to go back to normal, just flip the switch and go. But there are some that are uh, I'm trying to be very careful and trying to do the right thing to keep themselves healthy and safe. And we want to do that as much as we possibly can as well. Um, so we do, we do appreciate you all coming out this morning. And I'm thankful for Memorial Day and all that it means and those that paid the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, but we hope that you're having a good day so far. Just before we get into the service, a few announcements. Uh, first, do want to remind you that we are having service this Wednesday in the building, okay? This Wednesday, one service here in the sanctuary. Uh, what we're going to be doing is we'll have a normal service, but we're also going to be going over some of our guidelines um, and some of the things that we're going to do for the next Wednesday, okay? So this Wednesday, one service in here in the sanctuary. Uh, Mr. Brandon is going to come and give some of the guidelines. We're going to start Creation Club a week from Wednesday, okay? The first Wednesday in June, we will start Creation Club. So Mr. Brandon is going to come and kind of give some of those guidelines. Uh, we're also going to start Youth Group back next Wednesday. Not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. But this Wednesday, we want to go ahead and, and lay out those guidelines and let you know how we're going to do what we're going to do um, because we understand. It's not going to go back to uh, exactly normal what it was uh, right off the bat. There are going to be some phasing in things we're going to do. Uh, so please be here this Wednesday. We'll have a good service, a good time in the Lord. One service here in the sanctuary, okay? Um, I think that's all I have for announcements other than uh, please pray for Pastor Jeff and the family. Um, they, of course, left uh, this morning after the service to head towards Missouri to drop James and Anna off. So please be in prayer for them. No doubt it's going to be a stressful time and a hard time emotionally and physically for them. So just keep them in your prayers. They'll be gone all week getting James and Anna set up. So pray for them and all that's going to go on there. All right. But let's go ahead and open our service in prayer and we'll see what the Lord has for us tonight. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, we love you. We just want to thank you for the ability we have to meet together. Thank you for the services we had this morning. I understand it may have been a little weird and a little awkward, but Lord, you're still good. You are still holy. You are still high and lifted up. God, we just want to thank you for all that you do. Lord, I pray that you will use this service tonight to bless somebody, to help somebody, to encourage somebody, to lift somebody up, Lord, to, to show them why you do what you do. Lord, we love you and thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
We are living in a time of great confusion. The struggle still goes on for souls of men. Our freedoms are in peril of destruction. But we know with Jesus Christ we will win. Stand for the right. that lifts up any people and sin is a reproach to any land the grace of God the only explanation for the blessings we have seen from his hand
Thank you for all that music. Um, now, of course, this is pre-recorded, so I have no idea what music Perry picked, but I'm sure since Perry picked it, it was awesome, and uh, um, I know it will. It was a blessing. All right, um, but uh, tonight, go ahead, open your Bibles, open your Bibles to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29. I'm going to give you a thought that the Lord laid out my heart. Actually, it was about a week and a half ago. I read through this in my devotions, and the Lord. Um, just kept bringing it back to mind, back to mind, back to mind, back to mind. And so we're going to read a passage here. We're going to start in Jeremiah chapter 29. It's very familiar, uh, but I think the Lord will have something for us, all right? Jeremiah chapter 29, let's start. We're going to start in verse 8 and read through verse 14, all right? For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Let me just pause right there and in verse 8. It says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Can I just say this real quick and then we'll get into the message. It does not matter what anybody else says. Now let me be very clear. I appreciate the fact that our president and our governor has always said that church is essential, but it shouldn't matter what a politician says. It shouldn't matter what anybody else says. What matters is thus saith the Lord. God has all, always declared that church was essential. God has always said that church was important, that church was a necessity. Now, now do not get me wrong. I am grateful for the, everything that the church has done to keep people uh, safe, and I'm on board with it, and it was a wise decision, all right? But we're getting back to the time where we need to say, thus saith the Lord, and get back in church, all right? Um, because again, I am grateful for President Trump and him coming and saying that church is essential, but let me tell you this, it shouldn't have mattered that he said it, and what's sad is that now a bunch of people are saying, yay, President Trump said church is essential, when we should have been saying all along, God says church is essential, so we're going to have it. Um, now again, don't get me wrong, uh, every Everything we have done here at Ripley Tabernacle has been willing. Okay, we've never been told to shut down. We were never told to not meet. Everything we did, we did because we wanted to keep a good testimony in our community and we wanted to keep you safe. But now that we have figured more things out about this virus and now that more facts are coming to light, we are understanding it's not uh, as bad as what they once said. And so we, we believe now we can safely meet for your benefit, for our benefit, for the church's benefit. But let me tell you, well, again, it does not matter what anybody else says. What matters is thus saith the Lord. And you see that in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 8. But now we come down to verse 10. And this really starts uh, the message, all right? So look at verse 10. For thus saith the Lord, there again, thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, pay attention, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return 
to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And then verse 14, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And then listen to this, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time. I pray that you would bless the reading of your holy word. I pray that you will bless the message tonight. Lord, there is nothing special in me that it deserves to stand behind this holy, sacred pulpit and declare thus saith the Lord. But Lord, you have chosen me. You have asked me to do something. And Lord, I just want to be a willing vessel used of you tonight to help somebody, to encourage somebody to, to, to break out the bread of life and give it to someone that they may be, get, be uh, helped through it, that they may draw closer to you through it. Lord, we do just want to be careful to give you all the praise and honor and glory that is due your name. Lord, we could praise you every moment of every day and it would still not be enough. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this place. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, cleanse me from within. Lord, remove me of self. I do not want to be getting into the flesh or say anything that I would want. But Lord, I only want to say what you would have me to say because that's what matters. It does not matter what Josh Gerwitz thinks. It matters what thus saith the Lord. Lord, please use this word. You promise it will not return into you void. I ask that you would just be faithful to that promise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. In this passage, you, you see in verse 10, as I told you to pay attention to, there was a phrase there that said, after 70 years. After 70 years. What had happened, I want to fill you in a little bit in this story real quick. If you were to go back to Jeremiah chapter 28, you would find a prophet named Hananiah. And Hananiah came to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was wearing uh, this, um, if you actually look, Back in uh, chapter 28, uh, verse 10, it says, Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and break it. Jeremiah was wearing this yoke as a picture to Israel of what was to come. Well, Hananiah, one of the prophets, one of the false prophets, came to Jeremiah, took that yoke off his neck, and in front of all Israel, broke it in pieces and proclaimed, As I break this yoke off of Jeremiah's neck... God is going to do the same to Babylon. Well, see, Hananiah was a false prophet. He prophesied what he wanted to prophesy. He said what he wanted to say. He twisted the holy scriptures of God and made them say what he felt like they want, like what he wanted them to say. And can I caution you today in today's age that is happening. You must be careful with what version of the Bible that you use because most, if not all that I found except for the King James Bible is a twisted men's perversion of what they want the Bible to say. So here Hananiah prophesies falsely. And he gets in front of Israel and he says, hey Israel, don't you worry about Babylon. Don't you worry about the captivity. Don't you worry about the tribulations that Jeremiah is telling you is to come. I have spoken to God and God has told me to break this yoke as a picture that God will break Babylon. Well, God comes to Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, Hananiah is a false prophet. He is, he is spreading lies and he is telling Israel something that is not true. And so uh, uh, God tells Jeremiah, go in front of the people. And that's where we pick up in, in Jeremiah 29, 10. He says, this is what I want you to tell the people. And so Jeremiah starts in, in 29, 10, in, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10, and he tells the people of Israel, he says, thus saith the Lord, after 70 years. What he is telling Israel is that you are going to go through persecution. You are going to have some slavery. You are going to live through some trials. You are going to have some rough times of life. This is no doubt. This will happen. And so the thought I want to bring to you tonight is this. The school of hard knocks. Most of our older seasoned generation understands that term. 
You see, that phrase uh, bears with it the meaning of going through something hard, but in the end, learning a valuable lesson. I believe that after reading and studying this passage of Scripture, this is exactly what God was telling Israel. God never told Israel, I'm going to save you from Babylon. God never told Israel, I'm going to wipe them away. What God told them is, you will have to go through this trial. You will have to go through this tribulation. But then he says this, after 70 years, I will come and help. After you go through the seven years, I will show up and release you from this captivity. Can I give you a couple verses in the Bible? Acts chapter 5, verse 41 says, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says this, That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And listen to this, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. May I, I hope you understand, may I tell you something tonight, dear friend, dear Christian, God has never promised to keep us from trials. He has never promised to do away with every trial. When we were saved, God never promised the child of God that you would go through life with lilies and butterflies and nothing and no heartache. That is not promised anywhere in this holy word of God. Instead, as we just read in those few verses, the exact opposite is promised. God promises and God tells us you are going to suffer. Jesus even tells uh, his disciples, you know, the world hated me, so it will hate you. If we're not suffering persecution, if we're not going through trials of faith, that would worry me. You see, wouldn't it be something, and I actually haven't even, I'm into my first point and haven't even told you this, but first point, I want you to notice their destitute position. God had told them that you will go through a hard time. It, it is for sure. It is going to happen. In those verses that we just read, wouldn't it be something that as you are going through a trial of faith, let's say somebody comes up to you and they say, hey, Josh, how's it going today? And I'm going through a trial. And something bad may be happening in life. Wouldn't it be something if instead of saying, oh man, life is just terrible and I'm going through this and would you just pray for me? It's not wrong to ask for prayers. I'm not saying that. But many of us just go in doom and gloom mode and say, woe is me and God doesn't care about me anymore and I'm just suffering through this trial. But wouldn't it be something if we did this and say, oh man, let me tell you about this trial that God is taking me through. Let me tell you about all that God has shown me through this trial. Praise the Lord that he is, he is still working on me. You see, if you are in a trial, if you are going through a tribulation today, what that means is God still has a purpose for your life because he wants to teach you something. In Romans chapter 3, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5, we're told that tribulations work with patience and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. You see, if we're dealing with something in life, it means God has a plan. It means God wants to teach you something. And if God wants to teach you something, that means God's not done with you yet. Take heart, Christian. Don't let your trials and tribulations get you down. Instead, flip the switch in your mind and start looking at them for what they are. They are an opportunity to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what these trials are meant for. That is why God allows those things to happen. So first, and, and I'm, I will tell you this, I have six points tonight, all right? Hang in tight. I will go through them fast. First, you notice the destitute position. Next, look at verse 10. The second half of verse 10. I want you to notice the dependable, the dependable promise. The dependable promise. Look at verse 10. God says, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will... 
visit you and perform my good word towards you and causing you to return to this place. The first thing I want you to notice in that dependable promise that God gives is his grace. Look at this. He says, I will visit you. There is nothing in me that deserved as a six-year-old little boy for God to come down and convict my heart of sin, for God to look from his holy and high throne of heaven and to look down on Josh Gerwitz and to say, I love that boy, and I want that boy to be saved. And so because I want that boy to be saved, I'm going to send conviction to his heart and help him understand that he needs a Savior. That visit by God Almighty is a grace of God. No where, no way, no how have you and I ever deserved the grace of God. The Israel definitely did not deserve for God to visit them. They were not good people at this point. They had gone away from God. They had served false gods. They had quit listening to God. They had had false prophets. But God said, look, after you learn your lesson, after you go through the school of hard knocks, I will visit you. I will shed my grace down upon you. You see, the grace of God is a wondrous thing. Every time you and I open this holy book, this inspire, this perfect book that God has left for us, it is grace. You and I do not deserve to have this. You and I do not deserve to open this. You and I do not deserve to read this. You and I do not deserve to speak to God Almighty. But He has shed His grace upon us so that we may. Don't ever take his grace for granted. I told you I'm going to move along, but then under this dependable promise, notice this. Notice his goodness. Notice his goodness. I will visit you, but then he says this, and perform my good word towards you and causing you to return to this place. Do you not understand, ladies and gentlemen, a young person, whoever is out there watching, that we serve a good God. We serve a God of, of, of chance after chance after chance, even though we do not deserve it. You see, the, this phraseology here in this verse 10, performing my good words, means that God is going to do the thing that he promised to do. God had promised to deliver them. God did not promise to keep them from troubles. God did not promise to give them just a, a, a life full of happiness and joy and, and no troubles at all. But what God did promise is to show up when they learn their lesson. What God did promise is, you know what? You've got to go through this trial because I got something I want to show you. You got to deal with this because I have something for you. I have something better for you on the other side. I want you to be drawn to me. I want you to come back to me. But the only way you're going to do that, Israel, is if you go through 70 years of slavery. And so God promises to fulfill his good word. You see, just because life may not be what you want it to be, doesn't mean we don't serve a good God. Because he may be allowing you to go through something right now, to be dealing with something right now, so that you will be drawn closer to him. And that, my friends, is a good God. You see, as a parent, sometimes being good means being harsh. Because you know what's best for your child. You understand that your child needs some discipline in order for them to be drawn to you, in order for them to have the best life, in order for them to make wise and smart decisions. And God does the same for us. You see, actually in the New Testament, the Bible tells us that whom the, love, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. If you've never had a trial of faith, I'd be worried. I would be, honestly. If, I, if my life was perfect and I never had a single problem, that would worry me because that means God isn't chast, chastening me. That means God is not trying to build me up into something. It would worry me if my life was nothing but perfect. I'm not saying we can't have blessings. I'm not saying we can't have mountaintop experiences. Those things are good. Those things are needful, and God will do those. But there are times when life is not going to be what you or I wanted it to be. So you notice the destitute position. You notice, in, uh, and also in verse 10, the dependable promise. Then look at verse 11. The determined plan. The de Excuse me. Whew. The determined plan. Look at verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. 
Under this determined plan, the first thing I want you to notice, of course, is the plan. God says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. I, God already has a plan for your life. And that, as I was looking at this and I was studying this, that just blew my mind. Think about this for a second. The God of heaven, the God that literally spoke the worlds into existence, the God that parted the Red Sea, the God that shut the, uh, the lion's mouths for Daniel, the God that, that showed up as that fourth person in the fiery furnace, the God that raised Lazarus from the dead and le- raised Jesus from the dead and raised all the uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead and healed blinded eyes and made lame legs to walk and did all of the miracles. That same God has a plan for you personally, not for you collectively as a human race. But God has looked down on you and said, I have a plan for you. This is my plan for Josh Gerwitz. This is my plan for Emily Gerwitz. This is my plan for Titus Gerwitz. This is my plan for James and Anna Messick, who is moving to Missouri. This is my plan for Joe, Bob, Billy, Sam, whoever. God has a personal plan. Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 5 says, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah... Pay attention to this. Whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans. God, in this verse, Jeremiah 24, 5, says, I have sent them away at captives. And then he says these last three words. For their good. For their good. What you and I are going through with right now is for our good. I personally believe that God is going to use this time of life, this this pandemic, this this worldwide crisis, as some is calling it, for the church's good, for the body of Christ's good. Why? Because we, hopefully, when we get back, or we were back this morning, and as we start getting back to normal, we will no longer take this place for granted. We will no longer take the Bible for granted. We will no longer take our personal relationship with Jesus Christ for granted. Why? Because God has done it for our good. And then Psalms 139, 17 says, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. And then in Ecclesiastes, the Bible says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. You see, God has a plan. And what listen, you and I as children of God just need to submit to that plan. You may be asking, Oh, but preacher, I don't know what that plan is. If you don't know what that plan is, then that means you need to get back in your Bible because God will tell you what his plan is for your life. He may not use me as a preacher to do it. He may not use Pastor Jeff, but I can guarantee you that if you would get in this Bible and read it and study it and love it, that God will show you his plan for your life. You notice the plan. Now I've lost my place. I always do that. Get excited, close my Bible and lose my place. You notice the plan. But then notice this, the prospect, the prospect. Look at verse 11. Hopefully you haven't closed your Bibles like I accidentally did. It says to give you an expected end, an expected end. That word expectful, expected means hopeful. You see, God already had the end in mind when he told Israel that they're going to go through the school of hard knocks, that they were going to go through this tough time of life. God already knew what the end result was to be. God already had his perfect plan figured out. You see, but God is never going to force us to do something. God is always going to give us the choice. But in his sovereignty, in his, his omniscience, he already has the end figured out. Our job as Christians, as ch- children of God, is to trust him and to follow him and say, if thus saith the Lord, I will do it. Prospect, hopeful end. Mark eleven twenty four says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. God has a plan. Our prayer ought to be, God, would you please bring your plan to pass? God, would you please put in my spirit and in my heart the willingness to do what you have asked me to do? The destitute position, the dependable promise, the determined plan, that's three of the main, uh, six main points. I'm going to go fast through these last three, all right? Look at this. 
The deliberate prayer in verse 12. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Notice first about this deliberate prayer, the appeal. The appeal that is made. Now, I find it interesting That in verse 11, God tells Israel, I have the plan. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace, not not of evil, to give you an expected end. God says, I know the end. Okay, I have it all figured out. I have the plans. I have the road. I've gotten the map out. I've mapped out the best route. So when you get to your destination, you have learned what you need to learn, and you have gotten closer to me. And he says, after I have this plan already figured out, Notice the first word in verse 12. Then, then shall ye pray, call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me. It's interesting that after God has already determined the plan, that then Israel does the praying. You see, God, for you and I, as I already said, has the plan figured out. He has already mapped out the best road. He has already put the X on the map, and we are to follow the guidelines to that X. Our prayer along the way ought to be, God, would you please bring this to pass? Whatever your plan is for my life, whatever you want out of my life, would you please just bring it to pass and give me the courage to deal with what I have to deal with? The appeal. Then shall you call upon me. Then look at this. The answer. I love this. God says at the end of verse 13, I'm sweating. I will hearken unto you. God says, I have the plan. I know the thoughts, thoughts of peace, not of evil. I have that plan. After I tell you about the plan, after you figure out what I want, then you're going to pray. And that's all right. As we read in, in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, pray believing. If God gives you the right desires, and that's a whole nother message for a whole nother time. But if our desires are right, delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give the desires of thine heart. Psalm 139, 7, uh, he will fulfill the desires of them that fear him. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, what, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them. If our desire is for God to have his perfect will, and then we pray for God to bring that about, I promise you he'll do it, because he said he will. Not because I think he will, but God has said that he will do it. And then he says this in his answer, under this deliberate prayer, I will hearken unto you. Praise the Lord that we still have a God that hears prayers. Praise the Lord that we still have a God that sees right where you're at, that can take his mighty arms and hold you tight as you go through these times of life. We still have a God with feet that can walk along you all along the way of life's dreary path. You see, Saul, I want to read something. Psalms, this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible because I think it's hilarious. I really do. Um, In Psalms chapter 115, verse uh, 3, we're going to start in verse 3 and read through verse 8. Turn there, if you will, with me. Um, The psalmist goes through and he basically mocks false gods. Look at this. Psalm 115, verse 3. But our God is in heavens, praise the Lord. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Again, praise the Lord that God does what he wants to do, not what we want him to do. Their idols, listen to this, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So as everyone that trusts in them. The psalmist goes through and he basically mocks these false gods. He says, hey, your false god has eyes, but they cannot see you. They have ears, but they cannot hear you. They have mouths, but they cannot speak to you. They have hands, but they cannot touch you or hold you. They have feet, but they cannot walk with you. But praise the Lord, our God has eyes that sees right where you're at. Our God has ears that when you call upon him, he will hearken and he will hear and he will answer your prayers. And we have a God with arms that will hold Hold you tight as we need him to. And he he has feet that will walk with us and stay with us and be with us because that is our God. We don't serve a false God, church. We serve a living God. We serve a God that loves us. We serve a God that has a plan for us. We serve a God that is alive. Woo! You may think I'm yelling out of anger. It's not anger. It's just joy. Woo! Praise the Lord. Look at this. I'm gonna, I really am going to finish up here. 
desired presence in verse 13. A desired presence. And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Desired presence. One, first, look, he gives, he gives, he tells you about the reward. You shall seek me and find me. The reward is God. Listen, at the the end of of the trial, if you you liken it to a treasure map, you get to where the treasure is and you dig up that treasure, you get to where X marks the spot and you take out that treasure chest and you get to the end of your trial, the end of your tribulation. As Israel got to the end of their seven years of captivity, the end goal was the presence of God. Look, the rewards in life are not houses, are not money, is not uh, <coughs> it's not cars or relationships. The, the reward of life is the presence of God. That's why I love preaching. That's why I love studying the Word of God because it is in, the, it is in those times that God shows up, that the Holy Spirit speaks to me, that God uh, fills me with His Holy Spirit and uses me as His chosen vessel. Because trust me, I'm not anything, but God is everything. Their reward is the presence of God. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. I press toward the mark of the price, <clears throat> for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Our mark, our prize is Jesus Christ. But then look at this. He tells us about the reward, Jeremiah does. But then after he tells us about the reward, <clears throat> he tells us the requirement to get the Lord, to get that prize, to get that reward. Verse 13, second half. When ye shall search for me with all your heart. When ye shall search me with all your heart. You see, God was going to put Israel through 70 years of captivity. They were going to go to this school of hard knocks to say, as, as, so that they could learn this. Right here. This is the whole message in a nutshell. Search for me with all your heart. How many of us can say that we are honestly, truthfully pursuing and searching for God with all our heart? 100%. In the New Testament, there were some lawyers that were trying to trick up Jesus. They were trying to ask Jesus, they asked Jesus, they said, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? If you had to pick one out of all of them, what's the, if we could only follow one, what's the one we follow? Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, he doesn't turn to, excuse me, he doesn't turn to him and say, uh, murder, that's the biggest one. Or, or using God's name in vain, that, that's definitely the biggest one. Oh, no, worshiping other gods, that's the big, no. What God looks, at, or Jesus looked at him and said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Israel had to learn to love the Lord thy God with all all their heart. Search for me, verse 13, with all your heart. Then look at verse 14 and we'll be done. The delivered product. The delivered product. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. Praise the Lord right there. That He says, when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found. God is not going to go hide behind a rock or behind a tree. God is not going to play hide and seek with us, okay? God will be found when we search for him. He is not going to press himself upon us. He is not going to force himself upon us. But God will be found when we search for him. And I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations, and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. I will bring you again into the place where I caused you to be carried away captive. Look at number one under this delivered product, the rescue. God says, I will turn away your captivity. God never said, I'm going to do away with your captivity. I'm going to keep you away from captivity. I'm going to not even cause you to go to slavery. No, he says, I will turn away your captivity. He says, you are going to have to deal with this. There's, I will not stop this bad thing from happening. I will not stop the trial. But he says this, I do promise to visit you at the end of the trial. I promise to be there with you throughout the way. And when you get to the end, when you're ready to search, to search for me with all your heart, I will be found of you. The rescue that God gives. But then look at this. 
the restoration. So the, the deliverance, the product of all of this, the end goal. Look at verse 14. I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. God tells Israel, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to bring you back to where you once were. You want to know why we have trials and tribulations and trials of faith? Why God allows us to go through the fire? Why God allows us to deal with some things that we would probably rather not deal with? Because we at once in our life are closer to God than we are right now. Christian, has there ever been a time in your life that you were closer to God? Has there ever been a time in your life that you would say, you know, I loved God more back then? If there has, and you're going through a trial right now, maybe God's trying to teach you and say, dear child, would you search for me with all your heart? Would you lean onto my understanding? Would you understand that the thoughts that I have toward you are not, my, your thoughts are not my thoughts, child. Your ways are not my ways. My ways are way above your ways. My thoughts are better than your thoughts. You can't even comprehend what I have in store for you if you would trust me, if you would follow me, if you would love me. Oh, dear child of God, would you, maybe right now, if maybe you're watching this alone, or maybe you've got your family around the TV watching it, if God has spoken to you, I want you to do something for me. Would you just turn around in your couch, in your chair, get on your knees, and say, oh God, would you show me what you want? Would you show me what you want me to learn? Would you help me to search for you with all my heart? Would you draw me closer to you tonight? Oh God, thank you for this trial. Maybe some of us need to just stop and thank God for the trial we are going through. I have had to learn this. And I learned it, sadly, the hard way, the school of hard knocks. I've looked back on some trials in my life and said, God, thank you. Because I never would have learned what I learned in that time of life had I not gone through that situation. Child of God, maybe that's you tonight. Maybe you just need to get on your knees. Say, oh God, would you forgive me? Oh God, would you just teach me? Would you show me? Would you help me? Will you hearken unto me? Would you deliver me, rescue me, and then restore me? Would you bring me back to where I was? Would you help the love of God to grow in my heart? Maybe you're sitting there and you're not saved. You're dealing with struggles in life and you just don't know where to go, what to do, where to turn. Can I tell you this? Turn to Jesus. Don't turn to me. I can't help you. I would, I would love to. I would try. But Jesus can help you way more than I ever could dream of. Salvation is simple. It's as simple as this. is understanding that you're a sinner and saying, God, I know I'm not perfect. God, I know I have failed you. I know I've sinned against you. There are times I've lied. There are times I've cheated, stole, whatever it may be. God, I know I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. I understand that you're real. I understand that you sent your son to die on a cross. Lord, I believe that really happened. I believe that he really rose from the dead. I do not believe it's a fairy tale. I do not believe that it's, it's something that people made up. I believe that it's 100% fact that it actually happened. And Lord, would you please come into my life and save me and change me? That's how simple salvation is. It's not the words. It's what happens right here. If you'll believe that with all your heart, God promises that'll save you and that you'll have a home in eternity with him one day. Christian, where you at? Are you going to give it over to God? Quit trying to fight this on yourself. We say, oh God, just teach me what you got to teach me. Help me to have the strength and courage to put up with it. Help me to love you more through it. That'd do us all a little bit of good. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, we love you. Thank you for Memorial Day. Thank you for those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice. Lord, I, I just don't have the words. I don't have the words to correctly express the gratitude I have for you, for all that you've shown me throughout life. Dear God, I just ask that you would just be with us this week. Bring us back again on Wednesday night to have a wonderful, great service. Lord, to meet with you, to, to talk to you, to praise you to lift you up on high. God, I ask that you would be with each and every one that is dealing with the trouble or tribulation in life, that you would uh, just wrap your arms around them, help them to learn what they got to learn. We're helping to understand that sometimes we just got to go through the school of hard knocks. 
Lord, we love you and thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you all. Hope you all have a great evening and come be with us on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. All right, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Good night.